In this video, we're going to learn how to calculate the size of the frictional force between two surfaces in contact. But first, we need to investigate friction a little bit closer. To do that, we're going to use the setup that you see here. There's going to be a plastic sled with a bowling ball inside of it. And so it's going to feel a gravitational force down from the earth. The table's going to push back up. And I'm going to try to get the sled to start sliding from rest and then keep it sliding at a constant velocity. The way that I'm going to get the sled to start sliding and then to slide at a constant velocity is by applying a force of tension using a wire attached to a spring scale. So the spring scale is going to tell us the size of the tension force that I'm applying to the sled to the right and the friction between the table and the plastic surface is going to be off to the left. Now, if this sled is at rest or it's moving at a constant velocity, remember that we know the sum of the forces on the sled in the x direction horizontally has to be zero. So as long as it's at rest or it's moving at a constant velocity, that means the quantitative size of the frictional force has to be the exact same size as the force of tension. So just remember that as you're watching these, this video, as long as this is at rest, whatever the force of tension is by, as measured by the spring scale, that's the same size as the frictional force. And when this sled is moving at a constant velocity, what the spring scale says will be the exact same size as the frictional force. So I'm going to gradually pull with more and more force, apply more tension to see if I can get this thing to slide. And the combined mass of the bowling ball and the tray is about three kilograms. So I'm pulling with 10 newtons, 12 newtons, and then it starts to move. So I tried to apply four newtons of force that didn't move, six newtons of force that didn't move, eight newtons of force that didn't move, and it took about 12 newtons of force to the right to get this thing to start sliding. Now, watch what happens. Once it starts sliding and it's sliding at a constant velocity, how much force do I have to use to keep it moving at a constant velocity? Turns out it's only about eight newtons. Let's watch again. Pull with four newtons doesn't go anywhere. Six newtons doesn't go anywhere. Eight newtons doesn't go anywhere. Only until I pull with up to 12 newtons does it start to move but once it's moving, it, it only takes eight newtons of force to keep it moving at a constant velocity. So in a couple of these situations, let's look at the force diagrams. So when I'm not pulling at all, when I'm pulling with four newtons of tension, when I'm pulling with up to 12 newtons of tension, and then while it was sliding at a constant velocity, while I was using about eight newtons of tension. So when I wasn't pulling on it, remember the combined mass of the sled and the bowling ball was about three kilograms, so gravity's pulling down on it with about 30 newtons. The table's pushing back, back up with 30 newtons. And if I wasn't pulling with a force to the right, that means there was no frictional force back to the left. And so it wasn't experiencing any frictional force when I wasn't pulling on it. When I pulled with four newtons, remember, it didn't go anywhere. So we know the sum of the forces has to be zero. So I pulled with four newtons of tension to the right, and the table must have been pushing back to the left with four newtons so that everything was balanced and the sum of the forces in the x direction was zero. When I pulled with up to 12 newtons to the right, apparently the table was able to push back with up to 12 newtons of force. That was the maximum amount of force that the table was able to exert on that plastic sled. And as soon as I got over that, it started to slide. Once it was sliding, it only took eight newtons of force to keep it moving at a constant velocity. And remember, things that are moving at a constant velocity, the sum of the forces is zero. So if I was using eight newtons of tension, that must mean the size of the frictional force was only eight newtons. So let's think about how big the frictional force was between the table and this plastic sled while the bowling ball was at rest. Well, it could have been as low as zero, and it could have been at maximum 12 newtons and anywhere in between. Because remember, that plastic sled didn't move until I pulled with more than 12 newtons. So if I pulled with five newtons, friction must have been five newtons. If I pulled with 8.95 newtons, friction must have been, again, 8.95 newtons. It matched my pull perfectly because the sled stayed at rest, but it had a maximum value. Once the sled started to move though, friction was eight newtons in size because it only took eight newtons for me to keep this thing sliding at a constant velocity. Turns out that we have names for those two forces. Static friction is the word that we use to describe the friction between two surfaces uh, which are in contact but at rest with respect to one another. There's no sliding going on. 
and the frictional force between two objects, in this case the table and the plastic sled, when the two surfaces are sliding with respect to one another, we call that kinetic friction. Here I swapped out the three kilogram bowling ball with a bowling ball and sled combined mass of about five kilograms. Let's watch the spring scale and find out how big is the maximum static frictional force on this object and what's the kinetic frictional force while it's moving. So you can see it took about 20 newtons of force to get it moving and about 13 newtons of force to keep it moving. Let's just watch that again. So the greater force I apply, the greater static frictional force will be pushing back to the left. And static friction can only get up to about 20 newtons of force. And then when I'm sliding at a constant velocity, I only need to use 13 newtons of force, which means the kinetic friction force in this case was about 13 newtons of force. So here's the question. We change the mass of the object, and apparently that changed the size of both the maximum static frictional force and the kinetic friction force. And the question is, what is it that changed that changed the size of the frictional force? Well, the mass went up, but let's think about what happened in terms of forces. If you increase the mass of an object, we know the Earth is going to pull on those objects with more force, so we increase the gravitational force. But if the gravitational force was increased in size, what other force also increased? The normal force, because there's no vertical acceleration in the y direction. So the sum of the forces in the y direction must be zero. So we increase the gravitational force and increase the normal force. What is it that really affects the size of friction? Is it the force of gravity on an object or is it the normal force? Well, when we just change the mass of an object and don't do anything else, we're increasing both the gravitational force and the normal force. So I want to think about this in a slightly different way to kind of figure out which one of these forces really affects the size of the frictional force. So if we go back to our three kilogram bowling ball, it took, you know, what was the maximum static frictional force? The maximum force the table could push back on this sled before it started moving was 12 newtons, right? Because it took 12 newtons of tension to get it sliding in the first place. Gravity was negative 30 newtons and the normal force was positive 30 newtons. Well, instead of adding more mass to increase the gravitational force and the normal force, think about what would happen if we used our hand and pushed down on the bowling ball with an additional 30 newtons of force. So now there's a total of 60 newtons of force going down and so there would have to be 60 newtons of force going up. Turns out that if we did this, it wouldn't take 12 newtons of force to get it to move. It would actually take double that. It would take about 24 newtons of force to get the sled to start sliding in this situation when you're pushing down on with an additional 30 newtons of force. If we look at the force diagram, it's this, like what actually changed? The force of gravity didn't change because we did not change the mass of our object. It's still 30 newtons downward but we added an additional 30 newtons downward of a push, which means the normal force was pushing back up with an additional 30 newtons. So the normal force doubled while the force of gravity stayed the same. So can we blame the force of gravity for the increased frictional force? We certainly can't because it didn't change in size, but what force did double in size? The normal force did, right? There was twice as much force pushing up on the bottom plastic surface of the sled, kind of pushing these two things together. And when the force that's pushing two surfaces together increases, which is the normal force, that's going to affect the size of the frictional force. So it's the normal force that affects the frictional force. I want to look at the two situations where we looked at the three kilogram object and the five kilogram object. And with a normal force of 30 newtons on this three kilogram object, the maximum static frictional force was about 12 newtons and the force of kinetic friction, which is the friction between surfaces that are sliding while it was moving at a constant speed was about eight newtons. When we increase the mass, we increase the gravitational force and the normal force. So for a 50 newton normal force, the biggest static friction could be was about 20 newtons and the size of the force of friction while it was sliding, we called that kinetic friction was 13 newtons. So what I wanna look at is how big is the force of friction in each of these cases as a percent of the normal force? So for instance, in the three kilogram example, maximum static friction force was 12 newtons. What percentage is that of 30 newtons? Well, it's a little bit more than a third, right? 
and what percent is the kinetic frictional force compared to the normal force? That's a little bit under a third. Let's just do a little ratio. 12 newtons divided by 30 newtons. The maximum static frictional force divided by the normal force is 0.4. So static friction in this first case was about 40% as big as the normal force. And kinetic friction was about 27% of the normal force. 27% of the size of the normal force. It was about a quarter of the size. Well, let's look at the 5 kilogram example. Let's do the same ratio to find out the percentage of each frictional force compared to the normal force. If we take 20 newtons divided by 50 now, the bigger normal force, we get 0.4. Actually really close to what it is in this case exactly. It's 40% the size of the normal force. And for kinetic friction, 13 newtons divided by 15 newtons is about 0.26. Again, really, really close. So it turns out that when you have, in this case, plastic against this smooth table, that means the biggest static friction can be, no matter what the mass of the object is, no matter what the size of the normal force is, is about 40% of whatever the normal force is. And how big will friction be when those two surfaces are sliding? We call that kinetic friction. Well, it's gonna be about a quarter of whatever the normal force is. So we could, use this to then make a prediction. If the normal force is 100 newtons, right? We use a total combined mass of 100 kilograms. Um, then we would expect the static frictional force to be up to 40 newtons in size and the kinetic friction force to be about 25, 26, or 27 newtons in size. So now knowing this, we can start to look at and think about how we can calculate the size of the frictional force, either static friction or kinetic friction in any situation. This is what the equation looks like on your AP equation sheet. It says that the frictional force or the size of the frictional force is less than or equal to some number times the normal force. Uh, this number is kind of like what you looked at in the last slide. It's that kind of the fractional amount of the normal force that tells you how big the frictional force is. And we actually call that the coefficient of static friction or the coefficient of kinetic friction. Uh, this value changes based on different pairs of materials in contact with one another. And we're gonna look at some examples in just a minute, okay? But basically, you get the size of the frictional force by multiplying some coefficient times the size of the normal force. Uh, our static coefficient of friction for the plastic and table surface was about 0.4, and the kinetic coefficient in the example we looked at was about 0.26 or about 0.27. So this one equation actually uh, encompasses both static friction and kinetic friction. So remember, our definition of static friction was the possible force of friction between two surfaces when an object is at rest or not moving, right? Static friction could be zero, like if you don't pull on something or push on something to try to get it to move, there won't be a frictional force. So static friction can be as low as zero or up to some maximum value. So the force of static friction will be less than or equal to the coefficient times the normal force. In the example we talked about, that coefficient was about 0.4 when we looked at the numbers. And so the value that you get in this equation is, is the biggest static friction can be. But remember, it can be as low as zero. When we use this equation for kinetic friction, remember our definition of kinetic friction was the force of friction between two surfaces when one object is sliding or moving against the other. And so in that case, we're gonna use an equal sign because if two things are sliding, there's one frictional force between those two things as given by this equation. So the size of the kinetic frictional force will be equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force. For the examples that we've been talking about, we've experimentally essentially determined that the static coefficient is 0.4 for plastic and table, or the plastic surface and the table surface, and the coefficient of kinetic friction is about 0.27. If you change materials, those coefficients will change, and the way that you'd have to figure that out is experimentally, just like we did in this video. So just to give you guys a couple examples of other coefficients of friction, you know, that you would plug in for this value called mu, the Greek symbol for the coefficient of friction, would be this, if we had two surfaces of ice, so we would imagine that's pretty slick, not a lot of friction. Uh, the coefficient of static friction would be 0 0.04, and it turns out that the coefficient of kinetic friction is about the same, 0 0.04, which means 
the frictional force is only about 4% as big as whatever normal force there is that's pushing those two ice surfaces together. If you look down one row, if we look at rubber tires on concrete, turns out that the coefficient is as big as one, which means if you have a you know, 2,000 pound car, that is, that's its weight, uh, that's gonna be the size of the normal force as well. That means friction can be up to 2,000 pounds. It would take 2,000 pounds of force to get it to start sliding. Um, the coefficient of kinetic friction though is smaller, it's 0.8. If it starts to slide, you would only have to use about 1,600 newtons of force to keep it sliding at a constant velocity. Uh, if we have the same rubber tire though on wet concrete, notice that both the coefficient of static friction and the coefficient of kinetic friction goes down. Or if you have that same tire on like a snowy road, um, then the coefficient of static friction is 0.3. It's 30% of the weight of the car or the size of the normal force in the car. And if things start to slide, then it's only 20%. Friction is what helps you speed up in a car. It's what helps you slow down in a car and it's what helps you change directions. And if friction, the smaller friction can be, the harder it is for you to do those things. And so when the road is wet or snowy, you got to make sure you're traveling at a slower speed because you can't have as big of a frictional force to slow you down when you need to or change directions when you're turning. After watching this video, you guys should now be able to calculate the size of static friction or kinetic fric friction for lots of situations. And there's only two things you need to know. Number one, how big is that coefficient based on the materials in contact? And number two, how big is the normal force between the two surfaces?